Good morning and welcome to Morning Movie News. Now, August continues to be a very slow month for any kind of news, but also entertainment news. And as a result, you're continuing to see rumors grip the headlines. For instance, that Hugh Jackman $100 million rumor for Wolverine is still floating around, and so is the $50 million Christian Bale rumor, both of which, by the way, have been largely discredited. And uh, this morning, even Hugh Jackman personally finally said enough is enough. I, that deal is not on the table from Fox for Wolverine. But yet still, the rumors continue to uh, be on front pages across the internet because simply there isn't anything else to report. Uh, however, Bleeding Cool, which you, you might be aware of it, um, Think About the Ink, my comic book YouTube channel, is loosely affiliated with that website. They're a very popular pop culture uh, website out of the UK. Uh, I really like them a lot. I know the people who run it. And they really do back, uh, fact check, do background checks on their stories. So I'm inclined to believe the latest report from them that uh, Searshi Ronan has turned down the role of the Scarlet Witch in Avengers 2 Age of Ultron. Now, on the surface, that might seem absolutely ridiculous, because who on earth would turn down a role in the Avengers 2 Age of Ultron? I mean, the first Avengers is the second most successful film of all time. And on top of that, Joss Whedon has admitted to writing the role of the Scarlet Witch specifically for Saoirse Ronan. So, I mean, there must be something really wrong with it, uh, or she must just be so disenchanted with genre films after The Host and Hannah that she, for her to turn it down. I just find it incredible. Uh, I'm also a little bit disappointed. I think she would have brought a nice um, indie vibe to the franchise and would have been a nice, refreshing change of pace from Scarlett Johansson, who, by the way, I very much like as Black Widow, but, you know, you don't want to see the same type of woman uh, in every role in the Avengers, just like you have some diversity with the male roles, I think you want to see it with the female roles. Uh, and I thought, I thought that Colby uh, Smolder, uh, Smolders from uh, How, to How I Met Your Mother from Maria Hill didn't quite bring that diversity. Granted, she didn't have a lot to do, but I feel, you know, she just, she didn't, not a lot of personality in that performance. So the person that Joss is going to next after being turned down by Saoirse Ronan, which, by the way, is an excellent lesson for all filmmakers, don't show your hand uh, until you have that actor locked down. Don't give your wish list uh, until that, per that person has agreed to be in the film because forever people will always know that uh, whoever he does pick for Scarlet Witch wasn't his first choice. So apparently choice number two is Elizabeth Olsen, also a very respected indie actress. Uh, however, she's not European and as Joss has said, the Scarlet Witch role is very important it's European. There's a big European bent in it. It's a big part of the character, that perspective. Uh, he, I think he described them almost like Euro trash, uh, which I think is very interesting. I also think it's interesting, by the way, how much discussion is focused around Scarlet Witch and not very much around uh, Quicksilver, who's supposed to apparently also be in the movie and is her brother. Uh, in the comics, they're always treated as like an almost an inseparable pair. I mean, recently they've been divided up more, especially with the No More Mutant storyline. Scarlet Witch kind of was got a little bit separate playtime, but they've always been defined largely by each other. And, and it really makes you think how long that maybe Joss has been considering an Ultron storyline because Scarlet Witch is so heavily tied into that storyline because of her relationship with the Vision, uh, her romantic relationship with Vision. Uh, so that's very interesting and it makes you think that there might be quite a bit of Scarlet Witch in this movie considering how important the role must be to Joss and for what the, the, the input he's putting into it and the care he's putting into casting it. So Elizabeth Olsen. She'll obviously have to adopt some kind of accent. Uh, but I do have to say, I'm not thrilled with this casting. Uh, first of all, it would be great to have a European actress, although considering all the Europeans who play American heroes, I guess, uh, you know, uh, it's only fair to reverse the situation. But I feel that she has a little bit of a similar vibe to Scarlett Johansson, at least the way Scarlett Johansson plays Black Widow. And again, I would love to see more diversity from these characters. So, uh, you know, who, I mean, I'm not quite sure about the European actresses I would pick. You know, the story just broke. I haven't had a lot of time to think about it. But I would, you know, I would like to see a different look. I'd like to see somebody else kind of in the role and, you know, not just, you know, different variations of the same woman. But I do think Elizabeth Olsen is a good actress. Uh, I think she takes roles very seriously. And I think she would be smart to take this role. And I'm sorry that Saoirse Ronan has been burned by genre filmmaking. But I think it's a mistake for her to turn down the role of the Scarlet Witch, especially when a director takes such care to write it for you. Now, obviously, granted, I, we don't know what the role is. We don't know. Maybe Saoirse Ronan is making the right decision. Maybe after the Avengers 2 comes out, we'll be like, Saoirse, you sure dodged a bullet there. But I think that it just elevates a career to such a degree to be in a film like this uh, that 
you have to you have to roll the dice. I think if you you know I know a lot of you say, well, you know what, Grace? Sometimes these people are artists. They're not in the business of Hollywood. They're in the artistry of making movies. And I would say, you know, and I guess both uh, Searcy Ronan and Elizabeth Olsen mostly work in the indie circuit. Although Elizabeth Olsen is moving into mainstream films, she might be in the old boy remake, but she's also starring in the new Godzilla film from Legendary Pictures. So, you know, Hollywood is a business, and if you want to be in that arena, you have to make business decisions. Now, of course, you can protect your artistry, but I think at the end of the day, uh, you get movies based on whether or not you can win an award for the film, or if you can bring in box office. Those are the two criteria that, you know, keep a career going. And if you can't do it, I mean, even awards aren't enough. If you are a big enough box office poison, look at Adrian Brody. Adrian Brody is an Oscar winner, but because he can't bring in an audience, he is moving to television. You know, they just announced that he is going to play Harry Houdini in the History Channel miniseries. It's a tough business. At the, at the end of the day, if you can't bring people into the theater, which is why I said Liam Hemsworth's career is in considerable danger, because, you know, despite the fact that he was in a bad script and maybe it was badly directed and poorly uh, advertised, he didn't bring anybody in. He was unable to add anything to that mix. And so that's why you have to be careful with the roles that you choose. And even, so that's also another reason. Take the Avengers 2. Get the box office win on your resume. Even if it's maybe not the greatest film you were ever in. Maybe it's not the greatest role you've ever had. But the, it raises your level of recognition. And look at how much more Scarlett Johansson and Chris Evans and Chris Hemsworth are able to do because of starring in that film. Uh, I mean, Chris Evans is going to be directing his first movie, all thanks to the exposure of the Avengers in Captain America. All right, so that's the first story. See she wrote it, turned it down, Elizabeth Olsen, do you want her sloppy seconds? All right, the second story, kind of on the same vein a little bit, is that they're making uh, a Macbeth film with Michael Fassbender in the lead. He hasn't officially signed on, but he's still very deeply, heavily in talks. And Natalie Portman was supposed to star opposite him as Lady Macbeth. However, Marion Cotillard, she dropped out, so Marion Cotillard is taking on the role. I think that's much better casting. I feel uh, I'm tired of a disjoint in ages and casting. Uh, Natalie Portman, talented actress. Uh, obviously, both women have the Oscar, but I think Marion Cotillard is a better contemporary for Michael Fassbender. Now, that said, though, I think it's funny because clearly the movie is going to get a lot of mileage out of its, the genre elements of the actors. I think you'll have a lot of people going, it's Magneto and Talia teaming up. And why do I say that? Because I was really surprised when the American Hustle trailer came out, and a lot of people in the comments section were saying, Oh, I wonder how Superman's going to feel that Batman is making out with Lois Lane. Oh, and look, Mystique is in there, too. And everybody was assigned, and Hawkeye, and everyone was assigning the comic book characters to these actors in the film. It was, so I think it's interesting, and this might be an unexpected side effect, that as comic book movies gain huge popularity, that the actors are associated really closely with their roles. I mean, it's funny because, you know, back in the day, Harrison Ford, no one would be like, Oh, look, Indiana Jones is going to team up with, you know, uh, Dracula, without, you know, for Air Force One. Maybe a couple of people did it, but it wasn't a big thing. But I guess because there weren't a lot of genre films at the time, people were focusing, Hollywood was focusing more on story and dramas and thrillers. Uh, and I just think that's really interesting. And maybe perhaps is a reason that you guys might eventually be right that uh, actors will be wary about which comic book roles they want to play because they're going to be associated with it forever. Uh, or I guess at least until the next person dons the cowl. You know, Christian Bale, everyone's saying, hey, he's Batman, but since he's very st strongly said he's not coming back uh, pretty soon, somebody else will be uh, Batman wherever they go. But I just think that's funny, and I'm wondering, uh, for all of you out there, write down below, do you see these actors as themselves, or do you only see them as their characters? When you see Daniel Craig, are you like, oh, it's James Bond? I mean, this used to be a problem only for actors who were well, who only established themselves first through these characters. But, you know, why would people, esta why would people associate uh, Jennifer Lawrence with Mystique instead of Katniss, when Katniss is by far her more successful role. So the whole thing I think is fascinating, uh, and it brings fanboy elements into Hollywood. Things that you see in comic books, you know, team-ups and stuff like that. You're bringing that lingo into other films, you're not even keeping it in the comic book movie genre. So I think that's fascinating. Uh, the third story is that when I, we know, I reviewed the internship, and I talked about the fact that Vince Vaughn always these days plays the exact same character. Fast-talking businessman, down on his luck. He's got a pretty girlfriend, but his girlfriend doesn't believe his BS anymore, but he always manages to kind of sweet-talk her. It's always the exact same movie. You know, he started off with Fred Claus. He did the same thing in the internship. And he's making a new movie called Business Trip, uh, which, you know, when, I first, when you first hear it, you go, oh, my goodness, it sounds like the exact same thing. But they announced today who's going to be joining him in the, in the film, and I think it's very exciting 
uh, and makes me excited for the movie for the possibilities for the supporting cast. First, James Marsden. Uh, I'm a big fan of James Marsden. I think that he got a raw deal as Cyclops. I think he's actually a very talented actor, very talented comedian, actually, which is interesting. Uh, you wouldn't expect it. In a, a lot of times, people like Matthew McConaughey, Channing Tatum, they get typecast as pretty boy male leads, and uh, they're overlooked for maybe their sillier, more interesting uh, sides. And I, it's nice to see maybe 30 Rock helps James Marston to show this, but I'm just excited for him to move into this. I also think he's perfectly cast as a businessman on a trip. And th basically the plot is they go, I think, to, like, an, to another country, I think Asia, I'm not sure, and they kind of get into some shenanigans. And then the other person rounding out the trio is Nick Frost. Now that's incredibly exciting. Uh, I saw The World's End before Comic-Con. My review is already up. It opens this weekend. I think Nick Frost in the film, everybody does a great job in the film, but Nick Frost does a great job playing a different kind of character and being a businessman. He really does a great job playing like the straight man, the straight-laced guy. Uh, and I was really impressed. And I'm so happy to see him be able to take what he's built there and now take it to another level. I mean, this is a huge break for Nick Frost. He's always usually working with Simon Pegg. I think Simon Pegg got a lot of attention off of Shaun of the Dead. He got a lot of uh, starring roles. He got to graduate to both Mission Impossible and uh, Star Trek. Deservedly so. I love Simon Pegg. But I think that it's great to see Nick Frost finally getting some attention as well and being able to prove, you know, that he can work on his own as well. I mean, I think that duos in entertainment or anywhere in life are great, but I think it's very restrictive and I'm sure difficult and frustrating for both sides of a duo when they become, like, you know, inseparable in the eyes of the public. I remember I was in school and there, uh, when I was in film school, there were these two European guys in our, uh, in our grade, our film, our film uh, class, and uh, they were such good friends for the first year that for the rest of the time, whenever they weren't together, people would be like, hey, where's the other guy? Oh, and where's the other guy? And they kind of would be like, you know, we're, we're not a set. We only met when we came to school here. We weren't even friends beforehand. So I always think of that when I think of duos. And of course, you have famous ones like Abbott and Costello and George Burns and Gracie Allen and Simon Pegg and Nick Frost. But uh, I'm sure that both of them would like to have some success to go separate, have success, come back together. So kudos to Nick Frost for landing this. Uh, and I think I'm excited for this Vince Vaughn movie because of who else is in it with him. It's nice to see him branching out. And, you know, Vince Vaughn, maybe that'll give him some new stuff, new material to bounce off of, and he too will benefit. I'm always in favor of mixing things up. As you might recall, I'm always talking about on this show how I don't like, you know, theater troops in film. I think it hurts everybody. I think it makes the film seem not as special, not as unique. I think it gets actors into ruts. Uh, and, you know, of course, everyone loves a good reteam, you know, but I think at the same time, Enjoy the magic that you had, move on. So on to today's question, which is actually about a topic a number of you were discussing in the comments yesterday of uh, morning movie news, and that's movie trailers. Joseph Chad asked me how I felt about the fact that trailers these days seem to give away the entire movie, and Carrie Moose agreed, uh, responding to his comment by saying that when she and her family often see trailers these days, they look at each other and go, well, we don't need to see the movie because we just saw it. And then Mr. Dave Hammerstein III, a uh, great handle, by the way, uh, he asked me what I thought of the fact that studios seem to be more focused on putting out great trailers than great movies, uh, focusing more on the selling than the product. And I think all three are indicative of a problem uh, in Hollywood right now. Uh, and that is just that it's too darn crowded. There's just too many movies coming out. There's too many movies this summer. There's too many movies this fall for award season. Uh, and there's just, look at 2015. It's ridiculous. It's already obviously too, too, uh, too crowded. And they're releasing more films all the time. Like Chappie just got slated for 2015. It's just, it's too crowded. Uh, now, for almost the entire time they've been making movies until recently, a movie could play in theaters for months, if not a year. Now, of course, there are exceptions to the rules. Uh, to, uh, if you're a big awards winner or a big box office earner, you stay in the theater longer, like Avatar, for instance, was both. So it had a very long playing time. But otherwise, you know, you have a couple of uh, weeks in theaters, and then you get pushed out. So it's really a, a case of make your money fast, get in, and not even get in, get out. Get out before, get, it, get in, get your money before you're pushed out. Uh, and that's because there's only so many movie theaters and so many screens, uh, and so, you know, there's just tremendous turnover. Even if you wanted to stay in a theater, you can't. So that really takes word of mouth off the board as a way to help a movie. It's not even really a factor anymore, which is unfortunate. I mean, it will come into play later on in streaming and on demand, but it's not a big factor in theaters. And that's because, so what, so what's going on? That's because, first of all, movies need to make money right away. They need, because that's the only way that people are going to keep people talking about it, because that's another problem. The movie news cycle has changed. Movies are covered often a year, two years in advance uh, while they're being made, and they almost become 
not newsworthy as soon as they open. It's, it's an interesting problem. And the only way you can get people to keep talking about your movie is if it's winning awards or making money. Uh, and that's why studios are so eager to make sure they win their weekend. That's why it's so crucial to win your weekend, because that's how you keep your movie in the headlines. People are talking about the fact, oh, it was a surprise hit. Oh, it was number one. Oh, look, it continues to make a lot of money. Uh, that's, that's the only real hope that you have to keep yourself competing with the, the news of movies that are coming down the pike for a year to two years from now. And because of that, <clears throat> studios are trying to optimize their ability to make a lot of money up front. One way is booking a huge number of screens. Movies open on a huge amount of movie screens, like 2,000, 2,500, that's considered small. Movies open on around 3,500 screens or more. A really big movie now will open on about 4,000 screens. Only so many screens uh, in America or the world. So that's why you're getting the quick turnover. Uh, also, that's why they want to have such a great trailer. They want to get you in right away. Movie be damned, because as I said, they're not playing a long-term game here, they're playing a short-term game. So they want to get you into the theater as fast as possible, opening weekend. And that's another thing. Somebody else asked me about why there weren't a lot of screenings for Mortal Instruments, uh, late-night screenings. I suspect because they don't want word of mouth about the movie to get out. I mean, they, re they really have been keeping that movie close to the vest. Uh, but usually, you know, they really want, they want people to see a movie early. They want to build that buzz, because as I said, once it opens, dead in the water. So Thursday showings exist, and you'll notice now they have 7 p.m., 8 p.m., 10 p.m. It used to just be midnight, and some have asked if that was the midnight shooting in Colorado that caused that. Uh, I, don't, I don't really think that's a factor. That was a tragic situation, but I think the reason you're having earlier midnight screenings or earlier Thursday night showings is simply to bulk up those Friday numbers because the, whatever a movie grosses on Thursday night gets rolled into their Friday um, gross. Their Friday box office gross. So going into Saturday, when people are making their movie decisions about what film to see, they are going to uh, base it some, potentially on a headline on Friday that says, "Oh wow, look how great this movie's doing! It made a ton of movie and it's a uh, ton of money in its Thursday night showings." And everyone starts to feel, "Oh, there's buzz. This is a popular movie. Everyone's going to see it. I should go." Uh, and also, it helps with the headlines on even Friday morning because they say, "Oh, look at how much money this movie made on Thursday night." Uh, it has a lot of momentum going into the weekend. It's an interesting way that box office is starting to be reported. I have my problems with it because it's almost impossible to get an accurate snapshot on Friday afternoon about how a movie is going to do. And so you have a lot of movies that are actually that are overperforming based on projections, but then by the time Sunday rolls around, uh, they're saying they're underperforming because someone came up with this ridiculous projection on Friday before even seeing how it plays out. Projections used to be made only on Saturday morning, but in the race to get headlines up first because of the way the search engine works, people are starting to make projections Friday a.m. Uh, off of those Thursday numbers and off of matinees on Friday, and I just don't think you can do it. So uh, it's really a kind of a, a tangled web. It's a little bit of a mess. Uh, it's kind of a studio's own doing. It's the way movies are reported. It's a problem. And it's the fact that the audience is going to see movies based on, you know, it's a po becoming a popularity contest, uh, which is also unfortunate. And that's why I go back to my comment about that you can't give movies a free pass. Good enough doesn't count because then you're just, you're just feeding this machine and you're making it okay for Hollywood to do this. All right, so that's today's very long morning movie news. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you to, anyone who, for, to everyone who watched it all the way through. Very much appreciated, and I hope you'll check out these other videos right now. Bye.